All right, guys, section 3.3, again, just continuing our discussions about how we can find these zeros or roots for our polynomials. Um, so we'll basically look at more theorems here to help us kind of break these uh, polynomials down. So the first one we're actually talking about is in terms of multiplicity. So we're saying that a polynomial uh, equation is solved by factoring and your factor occurs more than once. So in this example, we've got our x squared minus 10x plus 25 equals zero. When I factor that polynomial expression, it factors into x minus five, right? Negative five times negative five gives us positive 25. Negative five plus negative five will give us the negative 10. So when I set this equal to zero and I solve it, I'm gonna get x equals five as my answer, right? That's gonna be my root or zero of my polynomial. So we can say five is a root that has a multiplicity of two because the factor where five came from is raised to the second power. So depending on how many times that factor occurs, the root is going to have multiplicity based on that uh, occurrence. So it's going to be multiplicity two based on that exponent of two on the x minus five. So your multiplicity definition here is saying, if you have the factor x minus c, like this guy here, occurs k times in the complete factorization of the polynomial, then we can say our root c will have a multiplicity of k. Again, k is going to be what exponent is your factor raised to. So just to go with that idea, uh, we're saying if a root has multiplicity of two, then we actually count it as two roots. Uh, and we say a quadratic equation will have two roots in the uh, set of complex numbers. Okay, so we know a quadratic equation should have, have at most two roots. So with that multiplicity, we know my root of five is counting as the two roots. So this example here is actually just to see how multiplicities work. So you will notice that this polynomial is actually already given to us in the factor form. They didn't give us the big long polynomial expression. Can you tell me what degree this polynomial will have if I multiplied all of these terms together? So at x to the third, I've got x plus two to the second power and the two x. So is it six or seven? Alexander, did you have an answer? You were thinking, what were you thinking? To the fifth? Okay. What are we saying? You're getting three degrees from here. Seven? When it's multiplied, when you're multiplying the bases, you add the exponents. Yes. Okay, let's count. You've got three so far. X plus two to the second power, what will this expression become when you multiply it? It will become squared, yeah. So that's two more. Right, five, and then what power does this guy have? One, so it's gonna become six. So it's actually a six degree polynomial. So if it's a six degree polynomial, then at most, it should have six roots, right? Okay, so how many roots will this guy actually have? You are taking each one of those factors and you're going to set them equal to zero. So we've got x to the third, x plus two squared, and two x minus five. So to find each of these roots, we set each factor equal to zero. So that means x to the third equal to zero, or x plus two, the quantity squared equal to zero, or two x minus five, equal to zero, and then solve each one of them for x. How do you get rid of a cube? You will take a cube root, 
So we are going to take a cube root on both sides of this first factor. Cube root of zero? Yeah, it's gonna be zero. So what kind of multiplicity does zero have? Definitely not zero. Okay. Where's my definition? A root will have a multiplicity of k if the factor occurs k times. So how many times the zero I got was from x to the third? How many times does the x occur? Three. So since the zero is coming from the x to the third part of our factors, it's going to have a multiplicity of three. Do you see that? Where the three is coming from? Any question on where that three came from? So remember, from which factor does your answer come from will decide what the multiplicity is gonna be. So since I took my x to the third equal to zero and that's how my x equals zero came, that means this multiplicity is coming from this third power, okay? Now, with my second factor, we have x plus two to the second power set equal to zero. What's the first thing I need to do so that I can get my x by itself? Square root. Yeah, square root. So we take a square root. On the left hand side, we take a square root. On the right hand side, anytime you take a square root, you get one positive, one negative root. Uh, on the left hand side, square and square root cancel out, giving us x plus two. Zero doesn't take a positive or a negative sign, so you just end up with zero on the other side. And what's my x? Negative two, yeah. And what kind of multiplicity does x equals negative 2 have? 2. Very good. So that's a multiplicity of 2. And that 2 is coming from the fact that x plus 2 was raised to the second power, right? So since this guy was raised to the second power, our root will have a multiplicity of 2. Last one is 2x minus 5. And what do we get for him? So start by moving the 5 to the other side. And then to get x by itself, divide both sides by 2. And normally we don't say multiplicity of 1, but it has occurrence of just one time, right? Because this factor was not raised to any exponent of two, three, or anything else. So we have three time occurrence of zero, two time occurrence of negative two, which adds up to five, and then one occurrence of five halves, which gives us our six root. So when you count multiplicity, you will get enough number of roots. If we actually go back to uh, 3.2, and this example that we had looked at, Was it this guy? Yeah, this one right here. This is where we got negative one as our first root from that list of rational zeros we have looked at. And when I factored my quotient again, I got another negative one, right? So in this example, we can actually say our negative one also has a multiplicity of two because it occurs two times. Uh, for that matter, example four that we had done in 3.2 also has a multiplicity, I believe, on x minus one. So x, uh, the root of one also has a multiplicity of two on it. So we've looked at a couple different examples. Any questions with uh, number one here? 
So my MATLAB kind of sets it up a little bit differently. It will ask you to type the root, and then it will say it has a multiplicity of, and it will ask you to type the number in there. So for each root, I think it gives you a different uh, line or a different box to put your answers in. So when you do this homework, you'll see how uh, differently they kind of set up the way they want you to write the answer. So just kind of be careful about that. Okay. Um, this next theorem, the conjugate pairs theorem, is basically talking about that if you have a polynomial that has real coefficients, that means these numbers are in front of your x variable, that the constant term are all going to be real numbers. And they're saying the complex number a plus bi is one of the roots of this polynomial equation. That means if a plus bi is a root, then it's conjugate a minus bi is also going to be a root. Now, just to remind you of the term of conjugate, conjugate pairs basically means your terms will be the same, right? So I still have a and a here. I have a bi and a bi here. The only thing that happens with conjugate pairs is one's going to be positive, the other's going to be negative. So by default, we are saying if you get one of these complex numbers as your root, the other one is automatically going to come as a pair with it. So just as an example here, we've got x squared minus 2x plus 5 equal to 0. And we're just using our quadratic formula here to find the roots. So when we solve our quadratic formula, we actually end up getting 1 plus, excuse me, 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i as our root. So you can see in this case, automatically, we put both our conjugate pairs as the roots, right? 1 plus 2i, 1 minus 2i. For that matter, we just looked at an example. Uh, not you, not you. This guy. What happened when we solved our quadratic quotient? We also got our conjugate pairs, right? I got negative 2i and positive 2i as part of my roots. So that's what the conjugate pairs theorem basically says, that if you get one of the complex pairs, uh, conjugate pairs as your root, the other one is also going to be a root to that um, quadratic, um, not quadratic, but to that polynomial equation. And this will really come in handy when you try to solve an example like this. <clears throat> Number two is saying, find the polynomial equation. So this time they haven't given us the polynomial equation, they're saying it's going to have co real coefficients on that equation. But this polynomial equation has the roots of 3 and negative i. So how do we go back and find what our polynomial equation is going to be? So this is almost the reverse of uh, taking a factor. So the idea here is they're actually already giving us the roots, what they are going to be, which means I have x equals 3 x equals negative i given to me, we need to go back and first figure out what those factors will look like. And once we get our factors, then we can actually go ahead and multiply them and come up with our polynomial expression. So for this example here, we are going to have so if the roots that are given to us are positive 3, negative i, and we just saw by the conjugate pairs theorem, if one of the conjugate pairs is our root, then the other one is automatically our root also. So that tells me if negative i is a root, by default, positive i is also going to be a root of this polynomial. So that's very, very crucial to remember when you're doing something like this. They're giving us one conjugate pair, the other one comes with uh, that number. Okay. So each one of these is going to come from a factor of x minus c. So that means I will have x minus 3 as one of my factors, which is coming from this guy here. I will have x minus negative 1 as one of my factors. And I will also have x minus, uh, sorry, negative i, x minus i is also one of my factors. So each of these, when you're setting them up in factors, are going to be of the format x minus c. 
So that's x minus 3, x minus negative i, x minus i. Of course, when I have two negatives, we can make those into positives. So we end up getting x minus 3, x plus i, x minus i as my three factors here. But the idea is to multiply all three, and that will give us what polynomial uh, equation we have. So where would you start if you needed to multiply these three factors? Yeah, I would actually definitely go ahead and start with those two. And the only reason would be because since these guys are conjugate pairs, um, conjugate pairs, just to give you a general idea here, if I just have two factors that are conjugate pairs of each other, so a plus b, a minus b, when I multiply them, and you can try this with FOIL if you want to check, the two middle terms actually cancel each other out because of that plus b minus b, and you end up getting only a squared minus b squared. So that would be the easier one to multiply first, uh, and that one for our terms here will be x plus i multiplied with x minus i. So following this format here, that means I take my first term and I square that, so that's x squared minus I take my second term and I square that also. So x squared minus i squared. Does anybody remember what happens with i squared? Close. Negative one, yeah. Because remember, i is defined as square root of negative one. So if you're talking about i squared, well, the square and square root will cancel each other out, giving you negative one. So the i square actually becomes negative one. Again, I have two negative signs, so that becomes x squared plus one. So we still have our x minus three, and um, x plus i times x minus i gives us x squared plus one. Now, if you wanted to start multiplying from the left and moving uh, to the right, you could do that also. So you can start by multiplying x minus 3 with x plus i, and then the answer you get from that, multiply that with x minus i also, and it will still give you the same result. So you don't have to start with the conjugate pairs. I think it just makes it easier if you start with conjugate pairs. But if you work your way from left to right, you should still be able to get the same answer. Okay, so now here, of course, we'll need to still perform FOIL and get our final answer. So the first, outer, inner, and the last terms. So we are doing x times x squared. What will that give us? x cubed. Very nice. Then we are doing x times positive 1. Positive x. Negative uh, 3 times x squared. Negative 3x three squared. Negative 3x three squared. Very nice. And negative 3 times positive 1. Negative 3. Negative 3. Just clean this up, put it in order, and we will have x to the third power minus 3x squared. Positive x minus 3. And this is our polynomial that has a root of three, negative i, and positive i. Three roots, obviously we were expecting to see a third degree uh, polynomial term here. Questions on number two. Okay. So just remember the conjugate pair theorem tells us if you're going to have one conjugate as your root and the other one is also going to be a root of that same polynomial function.
So we have looked at the rational zero theorem. Rational zero theorem, again, remember, gave us the possibility. Sometimes we got eight, sometimes we got 16, and you'll definitely get more than that, depending on how many factors your leading coefficient and the constant term will have. So to, again, narrow that field down, we're looking at the next rule here, which is the Descartes' rule of signs. This will help us kind of narrow down all those options and hopefully make them a little bit more manageable. So remember, Descartes is, again, the same mathematician who came up with the Cartesian coordinate system, which is our x and y coordinate plane that we use for graphing. So Descartes' rule of signs is basically a method which helps us come up with how many uh, positive roots, uh, real roots, should my polynomial have, how many negative real roots, and how many imaginary roots should our polynomial function have. So this kind of helps us narrow the field down a little bit. But again, remember, none of these are giving us the exact answers. They're just giving us possibilities, which is, again, what Descartes' rule does here. So the way this property or this rule works is um, depending on the multiplicity, again, we count those solutions the same number of times. So if you have a multiplicity of three, that means those are three solutions. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, the first thing we will do is put our polynomial expression in the descending order. So start with the largest degree and keep going down and degree until you get to your last term your constant term. And then you're actually looking at the variations of signs. Variations of sign means how many times, as I go from the first term to the last term, how many times is the sign on my coefficients change? So I'm starting at a positive, and I'm going to a negative, right? So positive to negative, that's one variation my sign changed. Then I'm going from negative to negative, no change. Negative to negative, again, no change. And then I'm going from negative to positive, that's the second time my sign changed, and I'm going from positive to negative, so that's the third time my sign changed. So there's three variations that happened, right? As I went down, and you will see, we didn't do any calculation, we didn't change anything, we just wanted to make sure our polynomial was in the descending order, and we're just counting how many times did our sign change. So there are three variations on the original polynomial itself. So these variations will actually help us determine how many positive solutions, uh, real solutions, my polynomial will have. Now to figure out how many negative solutions our polynomial will have, you actually take the same polynomial, but instead of x, now replace all of your x values with a negative x. So this guy will become three times negative x to the fifth power, negative seven times negative x to the fourth power, negative h times negative x to the third power, negative of negative x squared, and then three times negative x, obviously the negative nine will stay the same. This is where we again need to bring the same rule, and I think we talked about this rule in chapter two. If I have a negative base with an odd exponent, a negative sign will stay back, right? So negative x to the fifth power will actually make this expression into a negative expression. If I have a negative base with an even power, negative times negative becomes positive, negative times negative becomes positive, right? So that means this guy will actually end up becoming a positive x to the fourth, which means this negative seven does not need to change its sign. But now here, I have negative x to the third power, right? Odd number, which means a negative sign will be left behind. So that negative sign with the negative sign from the eight, the two negatives, will end up becoming positive. So that's why this value became positive. x to the third, negative x squared. So again, squared, that's an even number. So negative times negative becomes positive, which means this sign did not need to change. It stayed at negative x squared. I have a positive three and a negative x. So of course, positive times negative will make it negative three x. And that negative will stay the same. This x uh, was not part of that. So for the positive number of uh, roots, we don't need to do anything. Just make sure your polynomial is in descending order and then count your variations. For how many negative real roots we have, this is the process we did. We put negative x in, and now let's count our variations. I'm going from negative to negative, no change. Negative to positive, that's one variation, one change. Positive to negative, 
That's my second variation. Negative to negative, no change. Negative to negative, no change. So there are two variations that are happening with the P of negative X, right? So what does this tell me? Basically, since I had three variations, This is with the oh. so I had three variations on the uh, P of X term. So that actually tells me I can have three positive real roots. But at the same time, we need to subtract it by an even number. We keep subtracting it by an even number till you either get to zero or a one. So if I subtract an even number from three, what will that even number be? <clears throat> two, right? Because I'm subtracting an even number from it. So three minus two will give me one, which means I can either have two or I can have one positive real root for that example that we saw in Descartes' rule of signs. When we did our P of negative X, we got two variations. So that two variations is telling me that I can have two negative real roots or I again keep decreasing it by an even number, the two minus two will give me zero. So either my polynomial will have three positive real number uh, roots, it will have one positive real root depending on uh, how it works out, and I can have either two negative real roots or maybe zero negative real root. So how does that really help us in deciding how many positives, how many negatives, and how many imaginary roots will my polynomial function have? So go back and look at this. What is the original degree of this polynomial expression or equation? It's a degree five polynomial, right? So if it's a fifth degree polynomial, that means at most we should have five roots for this polynomial uh, function that means if I am having so these are our possibilities I can have three positive real roots as one of my options I can have two negative real roots so three plus two adds up to five right which means I have no room left for imaginary roots at all. So this is one of my possibilities. I can have three positives, I can have two negatives, which means no imaginary root. But instead of three, what if I had only one positive real root? So that means I can have one positive real root. I will still keep my two negative real roots, but this is only adding up to three now. So that means it opened up space for two imaginary roots. So you can now have two imaginary roots. So that's my second possibility. So let's put a little or in here. Let's see, we got three positives or one positive. If we had three positives, but instead of two negatives, let's say we had zero negative roots. So how many positions did it open up for the imaginary then? Yeah, three plus two, five. Remember, they always have to add up to the total as your degree. And our other option here would be, I think this would be our last one, I can have one positive real, zero negative real, which means 
for imaginary. So like I said, it's not giving you exact answers for any of these rules or theorems. It just gives you possibilities. It helps us narrow down uh, as we try to work towards finding all of their roots. So looking at the variations, uh, let me see if I can get this on the same page, almost. So we had three variations on the original polynomial itself. That told us we can have either three positive real roots, or since we have to decrease them by an even number, we can also have just one, a positive real root. When I put negative x in into my polynomial function and then counted how many variations I had, that gave us two variations, which told us we can have two negative real roots. And again, since we decrease it by an even number, that meant we could also have no or zero negative real roots. Our roots should always add up to the total of the degree of our polynomial, which means five in this case. So if I have three positives and two negatives, that meant I will have no imaginary solutions at all. But if I got one of those variations, uh, which means instead of three, I had only one positive real, two negatives, which means I have space for two imaginary roots now, I can have three positives with zero negatives, it opened up space for two imaginary. If I had only one positive and zero negative, that meant it opened up space for four imaginary solutions. So which one of these it'll come out to be will of course only happen when we start solving it and looking at that. But that's kind of what the Descartes' rule of signs is talking about. Um, so the number of positive real roots is either equal to the number of variations, which was three in this case, or less than that by an even number. We're always decreasing these by an even number. Uh, for negative, again, it will be uh, the number of negative real roots is either equal to the number of variations for the p minus x function, or again, less than by an even number. So you're always decreasing these guys by an even number. This rule is really, really helpful if we have a concrete, there's zero solutions or there's only one solution. So if you get one variation for either positive or negative, then you know I cannot decrease it by an even number. So if instead of three, if I had gotten this guy as one variation, that means I would have definitely had one positive real root. If I had got zero variations, and that would have said I have absolutely zero negative roots. So if you get one or zero as your variations, then it really is helpful because that gives us a concrete answer. But if you get anything larger than that, then you can see since we have to decrease these guys by an even number, that opens up more options of what our solution might look like. So that's kind of what we're doing here in example three. They just want us to discuss three and four, the possibilities of how many positive solutions, how many negative, and how many imaginary solutions will we have. So let's start by looking at example three here. We are given our polynomial function as x to the third minus 5x squared plus 4x plus 3. So you can see it's already in the descending order, right? We don't need to rearrange it. Um, we just need to count how many variations are there going from the first term to the last term. So we're starting at x to the third, which is positive, we're going to negative, right? So that's one variation. And normally I just put this little arrow so I know my sign changed from a positive to a negative. Now I'm going from a negative to a positive, so that's another change. So I'm going from a negative to a positive, so that's my second variation. And then I'm going from positive to positive, so that meant my sign did not change, right? So only two variations. So two variations on the original P of X means you can have two 
or remember we decrease it by an even number, right? So two minus two will be zero. So this polynomial can either have two or zero positive real roots. Two variations on the original. Now to see how many negative real roots our polynomial will have, we need to replace our x with negative x. So that will give us negative x to the third power minus 5 negative x in parentheses and then square outside to the second power plus four times, again in parentheses, negative x, and then plus three has no x on it, so it stays the same. So what did I say? When we had a negative base to an odd exponent, what will we get? Yeah, you get a negative x to the third. What will happen with negative five times negative x squared? Yeah, because the negative x squared will become a positive uh, sign, which means this negative will not change. So that negative 5 will stay the same, and these guys just become a positive x squared. Plus 4 times negative x? Negative 4x. Negative 4x, very good. And then, of course, we have the plus 3 at the end. So once you clean it up, count how many times did our sign change. Once, because I'm going from negative to negative, no change. Negative to negative, no change. Negative to positive, only one time, right? One variation. So one variation. And this is kind of what we were talking about because that means I can only have one negative real root because I cannot do one minus two right because I cannot really have no roots you can have zero roots but you can't really have a negative one root so I that means whatever combo uh, we go for right whatever combination of positive negative and imaginary we go for you will always have one negative solution for sure so let's see what our possibilities are going to be So we can have two positive real solutions. We can only have one negative real solution. This was a third degree polynomial. So how many imaginaries can I have? Zero, because two plus one is three, which means we have no room for an imaginary solution. Or, what other combination can I go for here? Zero positive, yeah, because I had either two positives or zero positive, so I can have zero positive real solutions. I will still have a one negative real solution. So how many imaginary then? Two, yeah, because it still has to add up to three total roots. So that means there's room for two imaginary solutions. Any other combination that I can have here? No, because I can only have either two or zero positives. Since I only got one negative, I'm always gonna have a negative. And depending on if you have a positive or not, you get an imaginary. So the way this works, if you get this one negative or one positive as a <clears throat> confirmed answer, you know how our Rational zero theorems gives us all these eight options or whatever number of options. That means I wouldn't even worry about checking any of the positive numbers since I know I have to have one negative real solution. I would check all the negatives. The moment I hit a negative as a zero remainder, like I said, take the quotient, solve it, and solving that quotient will show you either I get two positives or I'm going to get two imaginaries and it's going to take care. Of itself. So that's why with these uh, Descartes' rule of signs, we like getting zero or one as one of our variations 
because that really helps us kind of set this um, number of solutions into play. All right, questions with number three. Okay, I'll give you guys a couple minutes. Let me see what you guys do with number four. Same process uh, as we did with number three. Alrighty, so basically, there was just a little confusion on when we put the negative sign in, how many variations we would have, but for the first part, you guys had the right number of uh, variations because we're going from positive to negative, so that's one change, and then we go from a negative to a positive, so that's two variations, and two variations means we will have two or decrease it by an even number, zero, positive real roots. Now when we bring in the negative in our polynomial, that gives us negative x to the fourth power, negative six multiplied with, again, negative x inside, square on the outside, and then your plus one. You really gotta be careful about putting those parentheses around, bless you, negative x, because otherwise we will have a tendency to carry forward that negative sign. So anytime you're introducing this negative x, make sure you always put that in parentheses, okay? So again, I have a negative base to an even exponent, which will make it into a positive value. So this guy will again become positive x to the fourth. Same thing's actually happening with the negative x squared here because again, negative times negative becomes positive. So my x squared will become positive, which means this negative on the six did not change either. So that's my negative six x squared. And then of course the plus 10 comes down as it is. So honestly, when I put the negative in, I still got my original function, right? Remember, this is an even function. We talked about even functions in the last chapter. So since this is an even function, uh, we're actually gonna get the same exact uh, function back when we put a negative x in. We will still have two variations. These two variations mean we will have two or zero negative real roots. Okay? So what kind of possibilities does that open up? What kind of possibilities are we looking at? You're actually give me the first one. What? It's not that hard. I'm giving you the simplest one to tell me. No? You sure? Mm -hmm. Okay, Valerie. Two. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so two positives, how many negatives oh, can we have? Negative, number two. Yeah, so we can have two positive real roots. We can have two negative real roots. This is a fourth degree polynomial. So how many imaginary? Zero, yeah. Zero. So the first option would be two positives, two negatives, zero imaginary. Okay. Trevor, can you give me a second option? Uh, two positive, zero negative, and two imaginary. All right, very good. So you can have two positives, but zero negatives, which means now we have room for two imaginaries. All righty. Very good. Um, Amy. Zero positive, two negative, and two imaginary. Very nice. Zero positive, two negatives, which means again we have room for two more imaginaries. And Alexander, did you figure out the fourth possibility? No. No, you got stuck on that? Who wants to give me the fourth possibility? Zero positive, zero negative, and four imaginary. Yeah, because both of them, remember, can be zero, which means we can have zero positives, zero negatives, and all four of our roots could actually end up being imaginary. Okay. 
are writing cards to me. I don't know if I actually had these written down. Good job, guys. Uh, did anybody have questions on that number four? Okay. Alrighty, when we're talking about, again, bounds on roots, this is also to help us narrow down um, all that big long list that we get through rational zero here. So we've got our um, Descartes' rule, so that will help us decide how many positives and negatives we should have out of that list so we can narrow it down a little bit. And then the bounds uh, basically tells us what my upper bound will be, which means if I find that upper bound, any of these rational zeros that go outside of that bound, you can discard those. Same thing with the lower bound. If you have any number which is below my lower bound, we can discard those also because these basically tell us between what numbers should our uh, zeros or our roots be within. So once we can get that lower and upper bound, we are narrowing down that field again. So in this case, we're saying, if your polynomial has no roots greater than a number C, then that C becomes your upper bound. If our roots are no less than the number C, then again, that number C will become the lower bound. So how do we find these? Uh, they're saying, Take your polynomial that has real coefficients and a positive leading coefficient and divide it by x minus c. Now this number c, uh, when you're trying to find the upper bound, is going to be all positive numbers. So they're saying when c is greater than zero, you start dividing, basically start with one. If one doesn't work, move on to two, three, four, five. You keep going, but what are you looking for? When you do synthetic division, your bottom row in the synthetic division should be all non-negative numbers, which means your bottom row of the synthetic division can have zeros and a positive number in it, but it cannot have negatives. So the moment I do my synthetic division and I hit this row where all my numbers are going to be non-negatives, that number is what we call the upper bound. So in that same way, when we're finding the lower bound for our uh, polynomial, you will look at uh, values of C which are less than zero, right? Which means we start at negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, we keep going. For the lower bound, we're looking for alternating signs in our bottom row. So it should go from positive to negative, positive to negative, or negative to positive, negative to positive. As long as the bottom row has alternating signs, we have found our lower bound. So non-negative numbers, with positive values to find the um, upper bound and then alternating signs with negative values to find our lower bound. Now here's the interesting part. When we are doing the alternating signs uh, part, which is looking for the lower bound, if you actually get a zero as one of the numbers in your bottom row, depending on do I have a negative preceding it or a positive preceding it, you can assign the opposite value or the sign to your zero. So if I need my zero to be negative and it's gonna help us solve this, you can make your zero negative. If I need my zero to be positive, we can think of that zero being positive. So just for the uh, lower one, you can actually assign a positive or a negative value if it helps you get that alternating signs. So let's see if we can actually find an example that will help us with that. This guy here uh, is asking us to find the theorem on bounds to establish what our integral bounds are going to be. So let's see what this guy comes up to. So number five. We are given x to the third plus 3x squared minus 5x minus 15. So let's start by finding our upper bound first. So with upper bounds, we start by dividing with positive 1. Uh, what will my coefficients be inside my synthetic division? Mm -hmm. 
One, three, three, negative five, negative 15. All right, very good. So synthetic division, bring the first number down as it is. And we're finding the upper bound, which means we should have only non-negative values, which means zeros or positive numbers only. The moment you hit a negative number, discard that uh, process. So one times one will give me one. Three plus one is four. Four times one is four. What's negative five plus four? Negative one. Negative one. So the moment you hit a negative sign, like I said, discard that down because there's no point going further uh, than that. So move on to the next number, which will be two. And then again, we have one, three, negative five, negative 15. Bring that first number down again as it is. Does this guy work? No. No, where does it fail? 15. Oh, and the last one. Okay, so let's see, two times one is two. That adds up to a five. Five times two is 10. That adds up to a five again. Five times two is 10, and yes, we end up getting a negative answer. The last one can't have a negative, so he doesn't work either. Well, let's hope three does. It does? Yes. Okay, good. One, three, negative five, negative 15. First number again comes down as it is. And three times one is three. Three plus three is six. Six times three? 18. 18 minus five? That would be 13. 13, very good. And 13 times three? 39. 39. Ooh, minus 15. That would be 24. Yeah. And again, obviously you should be able to see we are going to get a positive number uh, anyway. So that means the number three works. This is our upper bound. Okay. In that same process, we need to find our lower bound. So let's do that here. Now remember, lower bound, we use negative numbers and we're looking for alternating signs on our bottom row. So let's start with negative one. We're still using one, three, negative five, and negative 15. So the moment you get two positives in a row or two negatives in a row, abandon your process. So same thing, bring the first number down. That will give us negative one. Three minus one. So two positives in a row, right? No alternating signs. Don't go any further. You can stop right here because I got two positives in a row. I am looking for alternating signs. So one, three, negative five, negative 15. Will this guy work? Nope. Negative two, positive one, so he failed also. Negative three, and negative three works? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't? It works. Okay. Let's see. Uh, one comes down. One times negative three is negative three, which is zero. This is kind of what I was talking about. Since this is positive, you can assign a negative to the zero so you can get that alternating sign. So if this is positive, we count as this guy being negative, which means I should get a positive here for this to work. Um, all right, so where am I? Zero times negative three gives us zero. 0 minus 5. So it doesn't because I have positive. We're thinking of this guy as being negative. So this next one should not have been a negative. And so this is actually where it's failing us. Dang it. I was hoping I didn't have to keep doing this. <laughs> 4. Oh, no. 
four, again, one, three, negative five, and negative 15. Bring that guy down. Is four not working either? No. One, four, seven. Seven times four is 28. 28 minus five. 23, which I should have technically stopped at seven since I didn't have alternating signs. I think five should work. Oh, I hope so because this is yeah. negative five. Yes, yeah, negative. Oh, sorry. Oh, negative five. Negative four. Which means this is wrong here. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to do. Sheesh. So this actually did give me negative here. Positive, which will be zero. So if that's positive, that's negative. I can count that that's positive. Okay, what's wrong here? Where did you get the five? I don't know. You have a negative four and a negative one. Oh, that's what happens when you try to really go fast. Robert? I don't know what I'm doing at this point. <laughs> okay, let me see. One, negative four, negative one, positive four, which is negative one. That's where it fails. Two negatives in a row. Negative five. Please tell me this guy works. works. All righty, finally. One, negative five, negative two, positive ten, positive five, negative twenty-five. <laughs> positive, negative, positive, negative, alternating sign. This guy works. He is our lower bound. Now the way you write these answers is x is going to be between 3 on the upper end and negative 5 on the lower end. This is how you write your bound. You wouldn't think I know how to do this. <laughs> or maybe I don't. I don't know. All right, guys. Um, number six is actually bringing everything together because number six is telling you to find all the solutions. So this is where we'll use the rational zero theorem, the Cardis's rule, theorem unbound, and try to put everything and see if we can narrow down our solution. Do you have something very exciting to look forward to on Monday? All right, guys, have a wonderful weekend. Be careful. Hopefully the roads are drivable better than they were this morning. And have a wonderful weekend. Keep working on your homework, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Oh, here's your rulers. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you.